Uh, welcome, everyone. It is 1 p.m. EST, uh, 8 p.m. Jerusalem time. Uh, my name is Raid Jarrar. I am the advocacy director with Democracy for the Arab World Now, uh, Don. Don is the organization that was founded by the late Jamal Khashoggi uh, before he was murdered by agents of the Saudi government. Um, we launched officially in 2020 uh, to continue the legacy of Jamal Khashoggi and work on um, issues pertaining to democracy in the Arab world. One of the areas that Don and many of our partners have been following closely uh, are the developments in Israel, Israel Palestine. This is the fourth uh, event that Don has been uh, has organized with the six Palestinian groups uh, that have been targeted by Israel uh, recently. Uh, six Palestinian civil society groups targeted by Israel, uh, and the targeting is escalating uh, most recently. Uh, as you can tell, we have a big panel here, uh, six Palestinian speakers from the six groups. It's such an honor to, to be in, uh, in the company of speakers from all of these groups that have been silenced and attacked uh, by the Israeli government in the last few decades, let alone the last 10 months. Um, we're going to split today's event into two uh, sections. The first section is moderated by three of my colleagues, uh, Khalid Al-Gindi from the Middle East Institute, Lara Friedman from uh, uh, FMAP, uh, Foundation for Middle East Peace, and Zah Hassan from Carnegie Institute. Uh, I think that our first question will come uh, from Lara. Lara, do you want to introduce yourself and our first speaker? Sure, th thank you, Raed. I am Lara Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace here in Washington, DC. Um, it's an honor to be part of this event today. Um, we're going to start out today. I have a question I want to pose to, to Khaled from Defense for Children International. Um, and, and I should say that for folks who aren't necessarily familiar with the work of these organizations, we actually did a panel very much like this almost 10 months ago with all the same organizations where they, were, they really get an opportunity to introduce the organizations themselves and their work in greater depth. So I would encourage people to take a look at that. The focus today is more on the, the development since then. So, so Khaled, starting off with you, on the heels of the announcement last week by Israel, making the terrorist designations permanent, DCI's offices were raided and closed, and subsequently you, and this was very high profile on the news, you were detained, interrogated, and threatened by Israeli authorities. So I want to ask you to, to talk for a bit. Tell us about what happened, both with respect to the raid and with respect to your interaction with Israeli authorities. And, and using DCI really as an example of, of what we're going to be you know, talking about with the other groups as well, um, can you talk about the, the wider impacts, the chilling effects um, that, it, that the sector is experiencing and what impact that has on your work um, defending children in terms of your staff operations, your ability to fundraise and travel, and, and really the threat that's just hanging over all of you? Khaled, you are muted. Uh, thank you, Lara, and thanks, Raed, and uh, thanks to all uh, uh, the, uh, the organizer for this uh, very important uh, webinar. Uh, um, uh, I will try to be short to summarize the suffering of more than uh, 10 years uh, and uh, a lot of work, a lot of uh, suffer. So uh, what happened? Uh, early last Thursday is, uh, is uh, like a part of the campaign against uh, the uh, civil society work in Palestine and in particular the sex organization among them my organization. So my organization as example we, 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 uh, we were until now and we are under uh, uh, ongoing campaign from the Israeli right wing groups and the Israeli security, the Israeli uh, government attacking us everywhere through attacking our partners, uh, our donors everywhere. They failed during more than 10 years to silence us. So uh, the escalation started one year, one year ago, 29th of July, when they raided our office and they confiscated uh, computers and uh, assets and of course uh, some documents like files of prisoners that we are uh, representing in the Israeli military court. 
And later on, one month ago, uh, later, uh, they issued the, the defense minister, uh, the Israeli defense minister issued uh, a declaration to designate us as a terrorist organization. And later on, one month later, the Israeli uh, military commander uh, did the same. So uh, since that time, uh, we were under uh, risk. Uh, and of course, uh, what they shared with us is uh, there is uh, no information, just they shared with us different kind of uh, papers, uh, documents in different languages. But when uh, we reviewed it, uh, nothing uh, uh, when it comes to, 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 to facts and the strong evidence. So uh, we, uh, they gave us like a space in order to appeal to these uh, decisions, or designation decisions. Uh, from our side, we experienced uh, very well this Israeli military system. Uh, and uh, we are convinced 100 percent that there's no justice for the Palestinians. Only what uh, we will achieve is uh, such a kind of legitimating the Israeli crimes uh, when we approach uh, these uh, uh, tools that they gave us. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the appeal that we submitted, which is a procedural appeal to the Israeli military commander, uh, it took more than six months until uh, we discovered that in the uh, uh, evening of it, uh, the, uh, Wednesday, last Wednesday, uh, they sent a message to the lawyer that uh, the appeal was rejected totally for all. And then four hours later, uh, they uh, raided uh, the offices. So uh, our office was raided in the early morning of uh, Thursday. Uh, they broke the door and they steal uh, more than 75 uh, files. Uh, from the office, and uh, which is uh, for us uh, and the main concern now. Uh, now we now we believe that our uh, partners, uh, our uh, children that we worked with, are now uh, in risk, especially those who are witnessed uh, uh, when uh, we document uh, the violation against children, like torture and the treatment killing of children. So all these documents now, uh, I don't know where are, they are using it, but there is, as I said, many files uh, that with their, between their hands. Of course, also the files for the children in the Palestinian civil uh, courts, which is all, all the time considered as uh, secret information should be private, the privacy of the children should be protected. Uh, now, uh, all the privacy of the children are between the hands of the Israeli security and the army. I don't know who is using uh, else. So, uh, in uh, such action, we believe that it is another step of the escalation and uh, targeting the organization. And now, instead of in the past, they used to work in order to silence us. Now they are working in order to eliminate us, eliminate our work and even the organization. So uh, after the, the, uh, the raid of the office, uh, even in the same day, uh, we received uh, some calls, uh, unknown calls from uh, uh, we never uh, saw or experienced these numbers that they called us. But myself, in uh, Sunday, I received a call, uh, and I answered the call. Uh, there was, on the other side, uh, someone speak Arabic, and he tried to be like, uh, speak with me friendly. Uh, and uh, after I asked him to, uh, to, to present himself, then he said that I'm from the security, and uh, he asked me why it was about 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m., and they asked me why you didn't come at one. So I told him no one uh, called me and no one uh, asked me to, to come and where to where to go. He said, you have to come to the Shabak Center in Afar, uh, the military camp. And uh, I have to come today. Uh, and he was like, uh, yeah, uh, good with me because he gave me three options to go at three o'clock p.m. or 4 p.m. or uh, 5 p.m. Then I decided to go directly. I went direct. 
Uh, I don't want to go in details, but it was like a humiliating procedures, like uh, searching me uh, for about uh, half an hour, and then took me to a room, a small room, and where I sat for more than two hours, just sitting without any question, without even alone. And then they took me to a room, uh, and there, uh, then the one from the security who called me, he came and introduced himself to me. Uh, he was uh, tried to be nice to me. He bring also I brought with him like a cup of coffee for him and one for me, and uh, he. Uh, start to ask a personal question, but I believe that behind the questions is uh, something to show me that, yeah, uh, we know you very well and you know your family. So uh, it's like a message that we, uh, we can do something. So even asking me not about the names of my sons, uh, he was asking me, uh, giving me the name of the son and what he is doing, where he is work, something like this in some question i was i cooperated i answered but in other questions which is a private uh, private questions i refused to answer uh, and then he said you have to know if you don't know or if you know that's but now you have to know that from the moment uh, being in touch with the organization dcib or uh, representing the organization inside the country or outside the country, you will pay the price. So I told him uh, what, uh, of course, he continued that is the Israel state decided that this organization, according to strong evidence that they have, is uh, considered as illegal organization and uh, terrorist organization. So I told him what you are saying is uh, uh, wrong and uh, all what you have is lies and the lies now uh, is, uh, uh, shared with all the international uh, or the states around the world especially even in with your friends countries like in europe or in the us and no one accept uh, your uh, lies so uh, uh, I, be, I am very much confident that my organization is so far of what you are saying, and uh, we uh, only work according to the law, Palestinian law, the international law, and uh, I reject uh, your allegation. He said, personally, I have no problem with you, but I have problem with your organization as a terrorist organization. So, direct I answered him that uh, I am the one who is managing the organization, so I am responsible of every single uh, dollar spent in this organization, and of course, the, uh, the staff work. So uh, the organization is not the doors that you broken, and not uh, you broke, and not uh, the the uh, the files that you steal. He said, "This is what I have, and this is my message to you." Then I told, ask him, uh, I worked with the Israeli military record system for more than 20 years. Then uh, I never trusted the system, uh, but I have no problem to be prosecuted in the system. So the court is not far from here, 50 meters. Let's go to the court with your file and your information, and I will, uh, I will accept the judgment of the court. He said, the court is not now, but if you keep behave like this, you will be there later. I argue with him for a few minutes and then I, he asked me to leave. For me, it is now, if you ask me about uh, the consequences or uh, of these uh, actions against us, really it's like a message for a lot. Yani for the, my organization, yes, they are, yani, uh, they decided you know, to eliminate uh, our work, even and even to eliminate the organization itself. And uh, another message also to the partners who are working with us, donors and uh, all, that uh, you uh, have to stop working with the, this organization. Otherwise, as they did in the past, uh, I'm sure uh, they will try to uh, complicate their life and also to uh, yeah, maybe to attack them.
the third message, which is uh, for me very important, uh, which is a very bad message to the children, especially because we are working with more than 10,000 children yearly in person and maybe tens of thousands in indirect way. So we always uh, raise our, the awareness of our children uh, about their rights according to the international, international law and talking about international, global international laws that applied everywhere without any kind of discrimination. Now all what we worked with them since years uh, become nothing for them uh, when it comes to their protection. So uh, the children, the families are uh, now, um, they are not that much uh, happy to see their children get out and work with this eye because, of course, they are at risk. Uh, and now, uh, as I tried to conclude by saying that, uh, yeah, in DCI, we uh, now we uh, start to organize our work in order uh, to use the, the different kind of techniques in order to avoid any uh, uh, risk for our staff and our uh, workers. Of course, also to uh, in, ensure the security uh, for those who are working with us, in particular the children. So we'll keep uh, committed to our community, keep uh, committed to our mission and to our uh, children. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, and before I uh, hand the mic over to Khalid Al Gindi for the second question, I just wanted to acknowledge that we have three other organizations that are co-sponsoring this event, in addition to the four of us. Uh, those are the International Crisis Group, the U.S. Middle East Project, and uh, Century International. Khalid Al Gindi, take it away. Thank, thank you, Raad. Um, and and also, I would uh, encourage people to stick around for part two of our discussion, where uh, after we hear from the six. Uh, NGO representatives, uh, Lara, uh, Zaha, and uh, I will be having a discussion about the policy implications of what all, all this means for U the US and, and European policy uh, toward uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, so my question is uh, for Sahar. Um, obviously, you, your offices at uh, Damir, which works with Palestinian prisoners, were similarly raided. Uh, tell us a little bit about what happened in your case last week? Uh, what damage was done? What was taken? Was it all of your files? Um, and and in, in which case, what does the confiscation of these files of, uh, of legal cases uh, of actual prisoners, uh, what does that mean for, for those individuals who, who are currently uh, in Israeli jails? And what does it mean for uh, Adamir more broadly? Uh, good evening and thanks uh, a lot for organizing this and for the second time, unfortunately, we have to meet to discuss uh, these serious violations against the Palestinian human rights organizations. Actually, this time, uh, it's not the first time, uh, of course, to raid the office of Adamir. Back in 2012 and 2019, they stole computers and files and broke uh, furniture, cameras, and so on. This time, last Thursday, we were lucky that they just entered the office. I'm sure they uh, uh, blocked some surveillance technology, maybe, and I don't think they took any of our files because maybe they didn't need because we have all the data on our server. So I assume maybe they uh, uh, copied uh, uh, the server and also all the files that we are working uh, on. Actually, this is the legal files of the prisoners that we represent mostly in front of the military court system, which means we copy the evidences of the military prosecutors in order to be able to defend these uh, prisoners. but. I, uh, uh, I think the uh, implication of the raid and the uh, fact that they forced the closure of the organizations, in our case, we cannot meet now the families of these prisoners that we were supposed to represent. And not a long time ago, the administrative detainees, which we just learned last week that this is a peak in the administrative detention policy with more than 700 currently administrative detainees that they were boycotting the military court system 
uh, as a resistance against the policy of the administrative detention with the case of Khalil Awaudi, the hunger striker that Domir was not representing him, but much involved in the campaign to protect Khalil Awaudi and follow his health conditions with physicians for human rights. All uh, the visitation program for the prisoners to follow the torture, the ill treatment, the health situation, the family visitation, and all the daily conditions of these prisoners. We are totally now paralyzed. Uh, uh, this is, of course, on the level of the daily work, but also on the personal level. Some of, uh, uh, of us were facing harassment and intimidation even before what happened last Thursday. My colleague Salah Hamouri, the lawyer from East Jerusalem, that his ID was confiscated last October. He was arrested under administrative detention last March, and he's still under administrative detention. Me, myself, I was denied a, a boarding to the United States where I was supposed to participate in the World Social Forum in uh, uh, Mexico last uh, May and uh, the United States rejected my visa. I used to have a valid visa up till next year, March next year, and they canceled my visa without informing me what's the main reason for uh, uh, the cancellation. And uh, uh, as my colleague Khalid said, we could be arrested, we could be uh, uh, banned travel outside of the country. Some of us could be facing other complications, like if they have family unification uh, uh, process or any other uh, needs from the uh, uh, civil administration or the Israeli side, it could be used uh, against us. And this is would of course affect uh, our work, but uh, we will try, we will keep uh, uh, doing our work. This is, will not silence us with the support we believe with this international campaign and the local support from the civil society in the ground in Palestine, we would be able hopefully uh, to continue our work. And this is why it's much needed the international pressure in order to force Israel to cancel uh, the designation and all the related actions they are taking against us. Uh, thank you, Sahar. I don't know, Khalid, if you have any follow-ups or uh, should we move to the third question? Uh, uh, no, I think we should move to the to Zaha. Zaha, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ra'ed. Uh, Zaha Hassan, fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. My question is for you, Ubay. One of the points that the Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz made last week in his press release justifying the terrorism designations against Bissan uh, Center, where you work, and against two of the other civil society organi organizations, was that you failed to appeal the earlier October uh, 2021 designation. Can you talk about why Bissan didn't challenge its designation in Israeli court back in October? And talk about previous Israeli actions taken against Bissan Center and against you personally. Uh, you also happen to be a US citizen. So could you talk about whether the US State Department has reached out to you for support during um, your interactions with uh, the Israeli military or what efforts um, you've made for them uh, or have you asked for them to assist you um, since the raid and the closure of Bissan? Thank you, Zaha, and thank you for hosting this uh, panel with the organizations. Well, uh, the question is, is there a fair legal system for Palestinians? This is the, was the first uh, question for us as Palestinians. And the second was, um, does Israeli uh, legal system have jurisdiction over occupied lands? The answers to those two questions for us at Bissan and of course the other two organizations were no. Uh, the Israeli legal system has uh, no jurisdiction over us as occupied territory. This is tantamount to annexation. And we are against that, of course. And we would not want to give the Israeli uh, court system uh, the ability or the legitimacy 
to be able to rule or, to rule or uh, enforce Israeli laws on our organizations. A second aspect to that also, that also played a major role, is that the uh, Israeli judicial system is part of the apartheid system. If you look at the Supreme Court decisions, and if you look at the Israeli uh, court decisions all over uh, the years, you would find it that it's systematically, and this is not just us saying that, all major human rights organizations have also indicated that, they have systematically discriminated against Palestinians. For us, as Bissan, we, apply, we, we had, uh, we've been designated under two laws. The first law is the Israeli anti-terror law. And the first phase of the appeal process of it, you were supposed as, as organizations to go in front of a, a, of a committee that is part of the Israeli Ministry of Defense. So it would be under or under the supervision or under the guidance or under the direct uh, uh, influence of the same uh, entity and the same person that have designated us. So this is, of course, when you look at this from that direction, even the mere um, thought that uh, there is some kind of due process, it's not, of course, there. On a second level, uh, for the second uh, uh, designation of BISAN and the other organizations, of course, we were also uh, designated under the military occupation law as a legal organization. For that, all of us, the six organizations, uh, submitted a technical challenge to the Israeli military commander of the West Bank because they are in charge of the West Bank according to international law. And we thought that this is a way also to show that there is no due process. What you can see is that the effects of either challenging or not challenging these designations is the same. Although the three organizations, Bissan, Adamir, and UPWC have been designated as permanent uh, in the permanent uh, terrorist list of the Israeli occupation. Uh, we were also rated uh, as the organizations that were still going through a legal process, al haq DCI International, and OAC. So when you're thinking about it, the, for the Israeli legal system, there is no legal system for us as Palestinians. And this is a conviction that uh, I think even the legal organizations that have worked on representation, such as Damir and DCI, can further explain how this legal system is not just biased against Palestinians, it is part of the occupation and apartheid regimes. They are enforcing the discriminatory processes, they are the part of subjugation of the Palestinian people. On the second level, the Israeli violations against our organizations and myself, it's actually uh, started a long time ago. Uh, for our organization, for example, I was arrested in 2019 uh, by the Israeli occupation, first on administrative, uh, uh, administrative detention, and uh, then uh, fake charges were also brought up against me. Uh, and this case is actually, uh, was actually featured in the human rights report and the 2020, uh, 2021 human rights report of uh, the situation in uh, the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, where as a case of illegal persecution. Uh, for my organization, we were also, uh, as an organization, the Israeli army broke into our organization on the 29th of uh, July 2021, and they stole equipment from our offices, and they did not even submit any uh, justification for their violation of our premises. So even before the designation, our organizations, our lives uh, are controlled and violated by the Israeli occupation without any accountability. Uh, my phone was also hacked by the Pegasus uh, software. It was hacked from February until October uh, 2021. Uh, the organization was designated. We faced also Israeli uh, travel ban. I was travel banned. Uh, with my colleague Sahar and prevented from attending the World Social Forum by the Israeli occupation on the 29th of April, uh, 2022. 
Uh, I even submitted uh, through my lawyers, and it's been now four months. I submitted uh, just requesting for the decision until now. Uh, the decision of why I am of uh, that, uh, the justification for my travel ban, the duration of it, uh, and who made this decision. And until now, this documentation has not been uh, has not even been delivered to my side to my lawyers. So you can imagine what kind of legal system the Israelis have when you are a Palestinian. And yes, I am a dual citizen. I am a Palestinian American. I was born in the United States while my father was doing his PhD work there. And unfortunately, throughout the years, I learned uh, two facts. The first fact that it doesn't matter if you are American, Swedish, British, whatever, if you are a Palestinian, then you have no rights in front of the eyes of the apartheid and occupation regime of Israel. A second thing is that the US administration is not willing to protect its own citizens as the many cases that have been documented all over the years. I have communicated about my travel ban with the US uh, consular services. I've been offered zero assistance in that direction. I wasn't offered assistance also in the, my persecution by the Israeli occupation, my uh, hacking in the Pegasus software, the designation of my organization, the organization that I am the director of. And this is, of course, part of uh, US, I would say, complicity in Israeli war crimes. And actually, a couple of uh, weeks ago, during President Biden's visit, we also published as Palestinian Americans a number of cases that have documented the different facets of Israeli occupation violations against uh, Americans from Palestinian descent. And uh, this actually has also uh, showed that the US administration has failed systematically, and this has been going for years to protect its own citizens against these violations. And I would say they are actually complicit in that because the weapons the military aid that they are giving Israel unconditionally, the, even the uh, 501c status of settler organizations that are stealing not only Palestinian lands, but even lands belonging to Palestinian Americans. All of this is being done with US silence or US complicity. Th thank you, Obey. And, and I will say that the treatment of American citizens um, who are Palestinians is really quite glaring. Um, I think we need to mention Shireen Abu Atle as well. Um, the, the idea that the US government is extremely eager to engage itself um, when some American citizens have their equities um, undermined, but not all. Um, I wanna turn to Tahir Jaber from the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees. Tahir, thank you for joining us. Um, so most of the public focus, the public discussion um, around the assault by Israel on Palestinian NGOs ha has been on the idea that they're assaulting human rights defenders, right? Um, but there's another aspect of it, which is targeting groups like yours, which provide services and assistance um, locally at the grassroots level to Palestinians, whether you're helping women or children or health, education or farmers, um, you know, work that would fall under the category of what Palestinians call samud, um, you know, resistant res resilience. Can you talk about why you think Israel is targeting your organization and other sort of Samud organizations? Why is Palestinian resilience threatening to Israel in and of itself? I mean, this would seem like the most um, non-threatening of acts, right? Trying to help women. Um, and what impact does this targeting have on your ability to provide vital services on the ground? And, and with respect to targeting of, of your colleagues, you and your colleagues. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, our organization is a feminist organization that, uh, as you said, supports and defends Palestinian women's rights. Uh, in my opinion, Israel doesn't want social and democratic progression in the Palestinian society. Uh, women are uh, more than half of the Palestinian society. Uh, their role is very important in any democratic change. So uh, it's an Israeli best interest if uh, we Palestinians stay as reactionary society that doesn't value justice and democracy. Uh, we think uh, 
uh, this attack on our civil society and our organization um, as a whole and on Palestinian women, not only on us uh, as our organization, but also on Palestinian women and on the Palestinian society as a whole. Uh, add to that, uh, Palestinian women since Al Nakba played uh, an important role in defending their national um, uh, rights, presence, and uh, narrative. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, from Israeli side interest to uh, destroy this uh, important role for the Palestinian women. Yes, uh, we provide key services to women, such as psychosocial and legal support and economic support to help the women in their day-to-day -day resilience in face of all uh, kinds of discrimination and obstacles, especially forced by the occupation. Uh, regarding the, the threats that Palestinian women and uh, the union uh, are facing, uh, UPWC, like the other uh, civil society organization, like DCI, like Damir, like all of them, we are uh, facing uh, the Israeli threats ma since many, many years. Uh, UPWC raided many times, uh, and not only our main office in Ramallah, also our branch office in Hebron and uh, in Nablus, for example. Uh, a lot of uh, members and uh, volunteers and the staff in the union band um, from traveling. And uh, recently, they, since uh, two years ago, they, they arrested the chairperson of the union, Khitam Saafi. Um, what's new in this uh, designation and uh, the last uh, raid to our office that uh, actually we feel uh, not safe. Uh, not before, because uh, this uh, there is a lot of consequences after this raid. Uh, they threatened uh, a lot of uh, our women, members, staff, um, through mobile uh, calls or through inviting them for uh, interrogation. And uh, they threatened them, uh, not only themselves uh, to be arrested or something like that, but only they uh, exceeded uh, their limit to uh, to touch their personal life, like threaten them of their children, husbands, and etc. Uh, another thing that I want to focus on it that uh, during the last trip to our office last week, they stole uh, a computer and uh, different files, uh, includes the private information uh, for women, the beneficiaries who receive psychosocial and uh, legal support. Um, we are very worried about the privacy of those women, and uh, we know we don't trust this occupation, and we know there is nothing to prevent them uh, from using this information against women or blackmailing those those women. Because, for example, when we go to the um, to the interrogation, they, as Khalid said, that uh, they use some uh, special information about us and about the. Uh, our families to put the pressure uh, uh, on us to, to to talk what he wants or to, to do what he wants. Um, uh, the, um, another uh, yani aspect that uh, we want to focus on that uh, in UBWC we are around 100 employees, uh, around 40 uh, uh, jobs in administrative and 60 field work as uh, uh, teachers in kindergartens and uh, women working in cooperatives. And uh, this decision and the final step uh, the Israeli occupation take uh, would uh, let us, you know, make us uh, face a new threat of losing our jobs, especially the women who are living in marginalized areas and uh, working in field work taking into account that, uh, you know, in Palestine, the, there is a high rate of unemployment and it's not easy for women in 50s or uh, 40s years to find, uh, to find a new job. So this uh, constitutes a burden and a source of concern for those women uh, who are working in, on the union. Um, since all of them, uh, or 60% of them are from uh, poor families. Uh, as I said, uh, since this designation in October last year, we don't feel comfortable in our way. Uh, to be honest, yani, yes, we are strong. 
uh, we can yani, cons consist to continue and we find uh, different but different strategies to continue but to be honest with you nowadays we don't feel safe uh, until now we didn't go to open our office again this is not because we are weak just because we believe that we don't have any kind of a protection if one of us uh, faced the, the arrest or faced a problem with her uh, children or uh, uh, or anything because the it, the message was clear from the israeli occupation if you continue uh, they will make uh, they, I, as they said they will destroy our uh, personal life um, Again, we don't have uh, this uh, protection from anybody, the Palestinian Authority, the international community. And as Obay said, we didn't trust, we don't trust their uh, legal uh, system. Uh, yes, this step uh, make our life complicated and uh, our work also. And uh, yani on the administrative level it uh, consumes all of our efforts and time so uh, we neglect or we don't have time to follow up our internal issue uh, the, the, the daily work that uh, that we do um, so um, the consequences uh, like the other organizations we don't have something in you um, the bank, uh, our banks uh, until now are working, uh, are still uh, working with us, but we don't know in the few future is those banks, for example, decided to, to close our, uh, our uh, accounts. Uh, I think in this step will be very se serious and uh, will uh, practically uh, close uh, the organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Tahrir. Uh, I think the next question is by Khalid. Yeah, uh, thank you, Raed, and thank you, Tahrir, for that. Um, I'd like to turn to you, Mu'ayyid, uh, to talk a little bit about your organization and, and your experience, uh, the Union of Agricultural Work Committees. Um, what is it, I mean, first of all, tell us a little bit about your organization, What? Uh, but more importantly, why do you think Israel has targeted an organization that works with farmers, with Palestinian farmers. Um, what is it about the nature of it that Israel finds uh, so threatening? So if, if you could um, talk a little bit about that, please, uh, Mu'ayyad. Uh, thank you, you all about this opportunity to talk about uh, the sex organization. I will uh, uh, talk about uh, Union of Agricultural Work Committees. Uh, Union of Agricultural Work Committees work uh, a journey of more than 36 years in agricultural development and supporting of farmer state fastness, the SOMUD. Uh, from its establishment in 1986, work raised its slogan, protecting our land, supporting our farmers. The land and the farmers are the core of our work. WAC is a grassroots organization, politically neutral organization, and also is the largest organization working in agricultural sector in Palestine in the last three uh, decades. In the last five years, OAC implemented more than 150 projects, supported more than 100,000 farming families, rural women, cooperatives, and fishermen. During that, OAC constructed and rehabilitated more than 500 kilometers of agricultural roads that facilitate the access of hundreds of fam uh, farming families to their lands. In addition to rehabilitation and developing hundreds of dunums of agricultural lands and rehabilitation of grazing lands, harvesting rainwater, supporting hundreds of marginalized and uh, marginalized and woman-headed families and empower them economically. And established several, uh, established several of youth agricultural cooperative as alternative for new liberal models. OAC started the journey of food sovereignty since 2004 through establishing the local seed bank which is the uh, pioneering idea to protect and preserve our local and indigenous seeds. After that, work succeed in preserving more than 56 local seed varieties, which is distributed to our farmers for free to encourage them to uh, agriculture, uh, uh, agroecological model instead of chemical agriculture. 
Work also represents Palestinian farmers and Arab farmers in Arab region in the largest uh, peasant movement in the, in the world, which is the Lavaya Campesina. Uh, because of all these important roles of OAC in the ground and in the field, also because OAC working in Area C, which is controlled totally by Israeli occupation authority, also OAC working in uh, um, area restri uh, restricted areas in uh, Gaza Strip, for all of these reasons and for its important development uh, uh, role of the agricultural sector, the occupation authority pursued OAC uh, for several years, uh, starting in 2014, and they began incitement campaigns against uh, our work. Uh, and this wasn't stopped till the Israeli occupation authority designated OAC and other uh, six organizations uh, in, the, in their terrorism uh, list. And, it, uh, and they closed our uh, headquarters for uh, the uh, second time in this, uh, in this regard. According to your question, why the Israeli is uh, uh, going uh, uh, after work, this is really because we are working in Area C. Israeli uh, uh, government, which is, uh, as you know, it's like a right-wing uh, uh, government, and government headed with the, uh, with the settlers, they are uh, give the hand openly to the uh, settlers to grab and confiscate lands uh, in, in all area in, 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 in occupied West Bank. And according to our work in the area C uh, to supporting our farmers, the Israeli, they didn't want us to continue our work and they're starting to uh, throw the Israeli uh, settlement organization such as Regevim and NGO Monitor to uh, monitor our, of our activity on the ground. And they um, uh, attacking our friends and our donors and they sent uh, uh, hundreds of re reports to our, uh, even to diplomats and the state countries to uh, stop and to dry the source of funding for uh, uh, work because they didn't want anyone to work uh, uh, on the ground and to support uh, the farmers directly. Also, they didn't want anyone to uh, document their violation against agricultural sector. Work take the responsibility in Gaza Strip and even in West Bank to document all the Israeli violation against agricultural sector. Uh, uh, for example, in, two, uh, in 2021, Israeli, Israeli settlers grabbed and it uprooted more than 20,000 olive trees in the uh, area C and killed two Palestinians in, uh, by the Israeli settlers uh, uh, bullets. So, uh, the Israeli uh, uh, apartheid system, they didn't want any civil organization to work in democratic life uh, and freely in, in uh, occupied Palestinian territories. They do uh, uh, all of our effort to stop us to continue their work. In the last trade on our office in Ramallah, they confiscated um, printers, uh, computers, cameras, uh, uh, DVR for, uh, for camera and uh, uh, other things, but they didn't uh, uh, stolen uh, documents because they, to, to be, they are, uh, uh, they didn't want to have like a document because uh, there, uh, there is no evidence uh, for our organization to be uh, banned and to be not to, uh, continuous their work. It's a, this is that uh, clearly that the Israeli didn't have any uh, things uh, 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 strong to uh, uh, stop our organization. And they uh, just want uh, no one from this uh, civil, uh, strong civil organization to continue their work because our work is uh, critical to continue uh, on the ground to support our uh, farmers. Shawan, this question is, is for you. You know, there's this air of legality about the Israeli actions to shut down Al Haq and the other uh, Palestinian civil society organizations. Would you talk a little bit about the difference between rule of law, which we in the United States understand as a guarantee that individuals and recognized legal entities are entitled to equal protection before the law, versus rule by law, which is how Israel governs in the occupied territories? And please uh, also talk about the kind of legal jeopardy you and the other designated civil society organizations, the staff, supporters, defenders are now facing because of the designation and the closure order. 
Um, how will Israel's actions impact your ongoing uh, effort to hold Israeli officials accountable for war crimes before the International Criminal Court? Thanks. Sharwan, you're muted. I would like to thank the organizers and the host organizations. Uh, look, to make a story uh, short as much as, we, as I can. Look, we have been under a smear campaign uh, since so long. The reason behind is the nature of our work. Second, the uh, to close organizations and to designate it as a terrorist organization, it's exactly like the execution. If you execute a person, you can't execute a person without a due process. You can't execute a person, for instance, without evidence. You can't execute a, pe a person under which called secret file. That's easy, you know, it's ABC. That's the case. Second thing is why we say that this military order is arbitrary order. Even if the Israeli has an occupying power, you know, uh, they control by force, you know, the, uh, the, uh, our country and also our land, our people. But in the same time, in the same time, there is some main thing you know, has to guide, you know, their actions, uh, their policies in the occupied territory. This is according to the international humanitarian law for Geneva Convention. I don't want now to speak about the human rights. Let me speak, speak about the international humanitarian law. If the Israeli commander, the occupying power, if they want to issue, let me say, a military order or to change uh, laws that they were heritage and they have no right even to change these uh, laws, just in two reasons. One main reason is for the uh, welfare and the interest of the protected persons in the occupied territory. The question here, my question is, if a closing, you know, peaceful, legal organizations providing legal services uh, to the people, to the victims, to the protected persons is illegal. This is a case. This is, I would like to ask if this uh, come under this criteria. Beside this also, we are legal, peaceful organizations. We are not threatening, you know, because the other uh, criteria is uh, the, uh, the, let me say, the security of the occupying power troops in the occupied territory. What we do for the troops, what's, uh, are we threats? Except if the Israeli feel that our documentation, our documentation of human rights violations and even international crimes taking place in the occupied territory by the Israeli troops, by their uh, army, if that's documentation, and calling for holding the, uh, the criminals accountable is guns or let me say atomic bomb or something like that. If they deal with it like this, they have to say that clearly, they have to say that. That's the case. That's the case in our point of view. Because of that, they breached, I think the two criteria and the two standards. Here we look at this uh, military order is illegal. Another thing is the nature of our work. Why we are called there ourselves as uh, human rights organizations, human rights organizations for what? To document, to call for justice, to call for remedy for victims, and also to hold the uh, calling to hold uh, the criminals accountable. This is in face any, you know, dictatorship uh, uh, regime or oppressive regime. That's the case. This is, you know, the nature of your war. This is the nature of the, your mission. That and we have to stand in the face of the oppressive regimes because of that we can't follow, you know, what they say. What they say if it's illegal, you know, that's the case. And if it's a preaching and violating the international law principles, that's the case. ABC, it's like that. Because of that, we look 
at their order as an arbitrary order. It's also a violation. They are trying, you know, to silence us. They want to send us to our homes, going to uh, supermarkets just to bring, you know, some foods for us to eat, and that's it. And to close, you know, the space before us and to close everything. This is will not happen for us. You know, we are in this field 43 years, more than 43 years now. We can't accept this arbitrary and oppression over us. That's we will continue defend our rights. We will con uh, continue defend rule of law, not you know uh, uh, rule by law, uh, ruling you know uh, situation here. That's that's the uh, issue. You have to take in your account the uh, the philosophy and the nature of the work and let me say the mission of the human rights organization from one side and our uh, role is to to say you know the truth and uh, to speak out strongly in the face of the power that's the case truth to the power that's the case if we step back from that we will not become a human rights defenders and we will not become you know a human rights organizations other point is we challenge them. We challenge them to approve what they, their allegations and their accusations. That's, and they could it. they could it. If they have a secret things called secret fire or something like that, I'm sure that they have to show it to the CIA. They are dealing with the CIA in details about the atomic bomb in Iran. What's the secret file is more? That's, and they did. You know, they gave the Americans, they gave the Europeans, they gave all of their friends and they came to them and they said, we were not convinced. We are not, we don't accept your allegations. Maybe this is the first time ever in the history of Israel, because if they say things, this is, you know, the people, they have to take it for granted. Countries to take it for granted. I think for one main reason, because they haven't faced ever, ever any real accountability because they haven't faced ever, ever, you know, any actions against them to push them back to act according to international law. That's, and they feel that they enjoy impunity. They feel that no one can bring them, you know, before a court or let me say, criticize them. Because if anyone criticize, you know, their actions, maybe he or she will become like anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, things like that. They are expertise in giving labels. And now when they fail in the last 15 years to silence us, to push us back, to get us down, you know, and to dry our resources, this is the last bullet that the state used its uh, uh, political heavy hands to declare us as a terrorist organization. We are not ready to accept this. We challenge them to approve what they say. If they have a problem with Sha'wan Jabarin, the only thing I ask for, to be honest with you, a due process and fair trial. Let them take me today. I am at home. We will continue our work. We will not be afraid. Even if they take all measures, even at personal level, why will continue? Because work in human rights, it's not a job. Work in human rights it is a faith and belief. That's the case. We will not give up. We will not step back and we will continue working from the, our office and we will not recognize this military order. If there is the one has to be, you know, behind the bars, Mr. Gantz and his commanders, those they are responsible for a cr war crimes committing in the occupied territory, including, you know, Gaza, East Jerusalem and West Bank. Those they have to be. And also another thing is why? Because also we studied the nature of this occupation. The nature of this occupation, it's a colonial, settler colonial uh, regime, and also it's apartheid regime. And now apartheid used by all the human rights community over the world. They don't want anyone, they, the Israelis, they don't want anyone to say, this is the nature of this regime here. It's beyond ordinary occupation. That's, and they dislike it. They dislike it, but they try you know, to impose on us as the people living under the occupation, what they want us to do. I'm sure if we do and say tomorrow, we are living under five stars occupation. They are great and good and the only democracy in the region. 
they will nominate us for Nobel Prize. It will not happen. It will not happen, Zaha and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Shawan, for uh, a very uh, strong uh, remarks. Um, with, this, with this, we will uh, conclude the first part of our webinar for the day. I'm very thankful for um, Ubay, Tahrir, Sahar, Mu'ayyad, Khalid, and Shawan for, share, for joining us today. It means the world to us here in the US, especially as a Palestinian American myself, to hear voices of Palestinian um, organizations represented in English live. Uh, we have hundreds of participants live on this call. Uh, thousands will watch it later. Um, it's, it's, it's an amazing privilege to be with all of you. Uh, keep up the great work uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, the second part of this conversation is with the three panelists, Khalid, Lara, and Zaha. And I think it's very easy for us to, to transition into speaking about US policy because as uh, Shalan just mentioned, we woke up to news uh, just you know on Monday about how there is a classified CIA report that shows uh, that even the United States Intelligence Committee uh, does not back the Israeli allegations of terrorism against the organizations. So that, of course, we have a question. How come the Biden administration has not taken uh, stronger steps to condemn uh, Israeli uh, violations, or at least to distinguish the United States from those kinds of violations. Uh, I don't know who wants to start first, uh, Khaled, Lara, Zaha, I will leave it up to you. I'll jump in. Uh, you know, I want to just uh, highlight in this regard um, the, the U.S. response that we've seen. Um, the U.S. response since October 2021, when the six organizations were first designated, as terror organizations has been to hold off on any criticism of Israel for the move and to delay saying anything meaningful or taking any action one way or another. The way the State Department spokesman uh, Ned Price responded to questions about the raids and the closure of the offices on August 18th to me is really telling. First, he said, since the designations last year and throughout the course of the U.S. review of the information Israel provided about the basis for the designations, the U.S. has not, quote, changed its position on or approach to these particular organizations. Then he noted that the U.S. intelligence community was provided the Israeli dossier, and he repeated again that the U.S. <clears throat> did not change its position on or approach to the six organizations. And as... Um, uh, you noted, uh, Ra'id, uh, the Guardian newspaper also had reported that the CIA reviewed the file and found that it did not support the Israeli allegations. So what the State Department spokesperson didn't say is that these civil society organizations that are working to protect Palestinian human rights obtain accountability for violations and who work to enable Palestinians to live in security and dignity on their land have effectively been blacklisted by the US for years and are treated as untouchables by the US government officials based merely on Israeli uh, allegations. US officials do not generally meet with these organizations and they don't reach out to them. And we heard this from Ube. And as the State Department spokesman pointed out twice, the US government does not fund these organizations. Even the US citizens who head or staff um, these organizations have shared like, Ube, that they feel like they're not being offered support from US officials. And these are Americans. Um, and you know, Americans in other contexts are treated quite differently uh, when, they're, when they're facing these kinds of repressive uh, actions by uh, a government, a foreign government. At least one American, like we heard Ube, is being subjected to a travel uh, ban, all while there's no determination that he is engaged in any terrorist activity. Why isn't the State Department uh, interested in at least Ube's case. So when, this, when the spokesman says that the US has not changed its position on or approach to the six, he is essentially saying that these groups will remain untouchables and, uh, and that uh, Israel's word about them is enough for them. Uh, while I also found telling and troubling, or what I also found telling and troubling was the fact that the spokesman left the door indefinitely open for Israel to come up with some new information to justify its designation of the six. 
If that day ever comes, then the U.S. will be ready to subject the staff and organizations to the full panoply of U.S. financial and legal restrictions imposed for terrorism. Meanwhile, the effective untouchable status of these organizations may continue forever without the ability of the organizations to challenge it. So Israel's mere raising of a question about an individual or an organization appears enough to get a Palestinian civil society organization and its leadership or staff blacklisted without the benefit of due process or substantial evidence. And work of the organizations may be hamstrung by Israel without any response from the US. Effectively, the US has granted Israel a veto power over which Palestinian civil society organi organizations the US can engage with. If it, and if it's okay, I, I just wanna to add to that. And I, I think Zaha summarized the, the situation of US policy till now very well. I, I think it really is, is worth emphasizing. The US had the evidence that Israel gave it for 10 months and chose not to say anything. Um, and and, and I, I don't think it's possible to overstate the degree to which that um, laid the groundwork for the escalation we're seeing today. I, I think it's also important to say this question of evidence matters and this idea of leaving things open indefinitely. I, I said to another uh, another group yesterday, it's sort of like, you know, imagine you're a lawyer and, and you're defending someone accused of whatever crime and the prosecutor says, we're going to trial and goes to trial and presents his very best case with all the best evidence he can come up with. And the jury rules not guilty. And the judge says, except we're gonna keep the court, we're gonna keep this open indefinitely for more evidence to be brought. I mean, that, 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 isn't, um, that, that isn't a recipe for any kind of, of justice. It's not an honest process. Beyond that, I think there's a really important thing that, that needs to be understood and maybe isn't as well understood in the international community as it should be. And it was referenced, I think, by a couple of our speakers, which is the legal context in which these organizations exist and what that means for the question of evidence. I found the most troubling element of the US response to what happened last week to be the statement about waiting for more evidence. Because waiting for more evidence is not a passive statement. It is an active green light and encouragement for Israel to crack down further on these groups in order to try to manufacture more circumstantial evidence. And when I say manufacture, I say this, I mean, we have a, a lot of us have seen the dossier that was, was given to Europe because that dossier was leaked. And that dossier consisted virtually entirely of circumstantial evidence in the form of statements made by Palestinians under interrogation after they were being they had been arrested by Israelis for similar charges. And this is coercive interrogation. On top of the coercive element of the interrogation itself, the system itself is coercive. This is a system that can leave Palestinians in administrative detention, which is a fancy word for no due process. It's sort of like, Guant like Guantanamo Bay. A Palestinian can be held indefinitely on secret evidence with no due process. And, and on top of that, if they go into a system where they're getting a pretense of due process, that due process, so-called, can extend for years. And we have two very recent examples, which I think are il illustrative, that are worth just talking about for a second. And it's also illustrative in terms of how, the U how Israel views the international community or the contempt Israel has for the international community on this. One of them is a Spanish aid worker who works for a targeted organization. She was arrested and she was charged with a raft of terrorism related um, allegations. She eventually pled guilty because she was facing potentially many, many years in prison. And what she pled guilty to effectively was unknowingly providing aid to an organization that Israel defines the terrorist group. She didn't plead guilty to anything that Israel had originally said she played, she was guilty of. And it wasn't even an admission of support of supporting terror. There was not like a, I'm nothing like that. But Israel then held that up. This came out after the October designations, held it up as, ah, here we have more proof. And she was facing years in jail. No one can blame her for plea bargaining. And then you can look at someone, another case, which is Mohammed Halabi, who was a, a Palestinian from Gaza who worked for World Vision, right? World Vision, huge, huge 
well-respected international organization, arrested six years ago by Israel for allegedly funneling mass funding to Gaza, to Hamas in Gaza. It, the allegations were unbelievable when they were lodged because the amount of money was bigger than the amount of money that World Vision funds for Palestinians. Those allegations were investi investigated by World Vision. They were investigated by the Australian government whose money was at stake. They were, uh, there was third party investigation. Everyone said there's no basis. We find no basis for these allegations. Mohammed Halabi stayed in jail because he refused to plead. He said, I'm innocent. I'm not gonna plead guilty to something just to get out of jail. For six years, they kept him in that process, which is not due process, with secret evidence against him, pushing him harder and harder to plead. He refused to plead. Eventually, they found him guilty anyway, under a process, again, secret evidence, no real, no real pretense of due process. And now he's facing many, many more years in prison. The Israeli justice system is designed to either find Palestinians guilty if they go through trial, or to force them to plead in order to find them guilty indirectly and use that as evidence against other people. And what the US position does, the US statement of waiting for more evidence is like waving a red flag in front of a bull saying, go ahead and do it. And the raids that we saw last week is the beginning of that. And I think Palestinians, people need to understand the act of courage that we just saw by these Palestinian organization um, members, officials speaking on this event because their very decision to continue even to speak out as representatives or of these organizations defending them puts them in violation of Israel's anti-terror law, which is so broad and so broadly defined that they are truly risking their, the, the, their, their, they're risking years of their lives. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, there's something just so extraordinarily irresponsible about the US and indefensible about the US um, position so far. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything that Lara and Zaha said. I mean, it's uh, first and foremost, as, as Lara said, this is a, a huge act of courage on the part of, uh, of these six groups, uh, these six individuals to, uh, to continue to, uh, to, to speak about uh, and to continue to do their work. Um, because of this uh, this latest escalation, um, you know, a, a couple of points I, I want to I want to make one in regard to U.S. policy and one in regard to to Israel's approach to this. Um, clearly, uh, the the U.S. stance has been lacking um, first with its silence and then with its sort of um, you know ambivalence uh, to to put it uh, mildly. Uh, in, in its most recent statement, where um, they've said in, in a sort of roundabout way that we too are not convinced with the evidence that Israel has shared. Um, but as, as Lara and Zaha both pointed out, kind of leaving the, the door open for Israel to produce even more evidence, even if it's produced uh, in these very uh, kind of shady circumstances of coercion and so forth. Um, so but what this tells us really is, first of all, this is consistent with US policy over decades. Um, as we all know, the United States is not a neutral uh, observer when it comes to Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, it has never been one. Um, its default position, uh, with or without, you know, whether there is or isn't a peace process, is to provide an unshakable and unbreakable commitment to Israel. Um, there is a, it is called a special relationship for a reason. And so what this means in practical terms is that even when the United States disagrees with Israel, um, it is prepared to defer, uh, right? So in a way it's sort of negating uh, its own uh, disagreement, if you will. We, we see this all the time on settlements. We don't like settlements, but you know what? Uh, we're not really gonna say or do anything at the end of the day, this is your choice. Um, that impunity over the decades has emboldened Israel, has actually, I think, made Israeli governments successively more extreme uh, because there's never been a cost uh, for anything that they've done. Uh, and you'll hear this from the Israeli right. Oh, they told us if we build here, the sky will fall. If they told us that if we did, uh, you know, if the U.S. moves its embassy to Jerusalem, the sky will fall. Um, and the sky never falls. Uh, and, and it's uh, in large part uh, because of the, the cover that the United States consistently provides 
on all fronts, uh, political, military, uh, diplomatic, and, and, uh, and otherwise. Um, and so this is just the continuation of this policy. Uh, another thing that I've been really struck by um, is Israel's response to these organizations, right? This isn't how Israel deals with actual terrorist organizations, uh, much less, you know, there isn't a case where Israel invites uh, the, the head of a terrorist organization uh, to have a friendly conversation in which they say, you know, according to what we heard from Khaled and others, um, we don't have a problem with you. We have a problem with your organization. And so in a way, they're telling on themselves. They're telling us exactly. They know that these aren't terrorist organizations because Israel's not treating them the way it treats actual terrorists. Um, and, and instead wants to simply shut down their operations for all of the reasons that we that we heard in terms of accountability, in terms of their work in areas that Israel deems to be a threat to its settlement enterprise or to its um, broader interests uh, with regard to maintaining the occupation. Um, and so I think these are, you know, never mind what the international community is saying, which I think is quite impressive. I can't think of another instance in which uh, of something of this magnitude, where the stakes are so high, where there is a, a consensus, almost unanimity across the board, the United States, European countries, other donors, um, uh, some more vocal than others in rejecting Israel's uh, uh, designations and its evidence and so forth. Um, but that's not enough. Right. I think I think what what we're hearing from these organizations is unless those words are somehow matched with some kind of action, some sort of accountability, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, there needs to be some sort of pressure on Israel to to climb down from this. And I'm not sure that any of these actors, uh, including the Europeans, who frankly have uh, have been much more vocal than the United States, but I'm not sure that they're prepared to expend political capital uh, on, uh, on Palestinians at the end of the day, right? I mean, there are so many other things going on. There's an Israeli election coming. Um, there's the uh, Iran nuclear talks that look like they might bear fruit. I mean, these are big strategic priorities for the United States and for Europe, uh, and that maybe Palestinians and their civil society groups uh, are somewhat expendable when it comes to uh, these other broader strategic interests. Yeah, you know, there are, there are a couple other questions uh, pertaining to a U.S. angle uh, while dealing with the situation that came up during the remarks of the six uh, presenters and some of the questions from our audiences. Uh, the first one is that the U.S. is not uh, an audience to what's going on. We're not, you know, just sitting... Um, you know, as, as a neutral uh, arbiter who's watching what Israel is doing, the United States is very involved in funding Israeli security forces in subsidizing uh, daily actions by Israel. And as you mentioned, uh, in providing Israel with political capital. So I think that's one angle of what can we do as Americans uh, in this situation, because we are involved. Uh, these things are happening with our tax dollars and with our support. And that's one angle. The other angle, which might be even more troubling to many of our audiences, is the prospect of mirroring, of copying what Israel is doing to the you know, shrinking civil society uh, in Israel-Palestine. Uh, the, the prospect of mirroring that here in the United States by bringing some of these tactics that are being used by Israel against Palestinian organizations to be used here again, you know, against us, against nonprofits in the US. So I wanted to see like, if, if you guys have any comments on, uh, on either of these aspects. Sure. Uh, well, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, <laughs> just, would, just, go ahead. I'm sorry, we're, we're, all, we're all friends here, sorry. Very, um, just, just very briefly, I, I, I think it's important for all of us to keep the eye on the ball right now, which is clearly the Palestinian NGOs on the ground who are under fire, under immediate jeopardy. Um, at the same time, I think, it is also important to be start extrapolating from the current crisis to think about second and third order impacts. 
Um, whether you're talking here about impacts on the ground for the rest of the Palestinian NGO sector, with the chilling effect across that entire sector, not just on these organizations, potential chilling effect on funding for the entire Palestinian sector. Um, you know, I, I think it is it is not an it is not an exaggeration to say that Palestinian civil society writ large is under threat here, not just these, it's actually seven organizations. It's six plus the one that was also rated that had been previously um, declared illegal. Beyond that, you've got second order effects facing the NGOs in Israel that operate under Israeli law. And these are both Jewish Israeli NGOs and NGOs that are run by Palestinian citizens of Israel, which are all deeply connected to the Palestinian NGOs and which have shown really, I think, admirable solidarity speaking out. And in so doing, under Israel's, again, extremely broad and broadly interpreted anti-terror law, have put themselves in jeopardy of being, being they are technically violating Israel's anti-terror law as Israeli organizations, and they live in Israel under Israeli law. So there's a danger there. There's a th there are third order impacts. I mean, the, the potential impact, and I say this as a funder for, for the international funding organizations, including European governments and private funders who fund in this sector. This is a very real, real challenge. It, you know, Israel can do what it wants. The international community can say we don't agree, but the ability to get money to them is a real issue. So far, it's possible. If it's not possible to fund them, chilling effect or no chilling effect, if they can't be funded, they can't operate. And by the time the U.S. decides, hey, we're going to render an opinion, there may be nothing left to render an opinion about on either side of the green line when it comes to progressive admin, progressive NGOs. And then we can look at the broader effects. This is Israel ostensibly, according to Israel and its great ally, the US, a democratic country, a great liberal democracy, essentially giving a kosher stamp to a tactic which it did not invent. This is a tactic that is beloved of authoritarian regimes worldwide, which is looking to slander and quash and silence and, and otherwise um, destroy critics, right? It didn't invent this. But there's a difference between someone, a leader of an um, openly non-democratic, uh, maybe more pariah type nation doing this, and the best um, friend of the United States who's defended and supported by the US doing it. It's a very different kind of kosher stamp. So the second, third order, fourth order effects are, are massive. Um, and in terms of going back to the start of your question, look, the US, uh, certainly let's, speaking about Europe, Europe does have leverage it can exert. There was a wonderful thread on Twitter um, by, by a guy named Martin Konechny today who works in Brussels looking at some of that because you know this is a real, what Israel has done this week is a finger in the eye to Europe. Europe is directly implicated in these designations because Europe funds these groups, right? Um, and the fact that Israel is doing this while Europe is, is not only continuing to, to be Israel's largest trade partner, its great ally, they're, 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 really, they're, they're actually in a stage of, of expanding relations with Israel, restarting some things that Israel has been wanting for a long time while they're getting this contempt in response from Israel. So there, there's leverage there. On the U.S. side, there's always leverage, but there's been a historical or historic um, unwillingness of every administration of any party to exert it. Um, it's difficult to imagine that this administration, given its, its political uh, sensibilities, which we have seen long before October, um, uh, lean in favor of doing nothing to publicly clash with Israel or even really to privately clash with them as far as we can tell, and to the extent that they want to spend political capital on this, reserving it exclusively for Iran, Iran-related issues. It's difficult to believe that they would spend political capital. Then again, on something like Shirin Abu Atle, they may not have wanted to spend political capital, but a strong response from Congress actually forced them to do so. It hasn't forced them to do enough, but it's forced them to do more than I think a lot of people ever imagined they would. Is it possible that can happen here? Remains to be seen. I'll just top off what Lada said, putting aside whether they would be willing to do something. It's interesting that this year we have two new strategy, national strategy papers that were published, one in April that deals with uh, the strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, and then a second paper that came out just in July that talks about you know, how to um, anticipate, respond, and prevent um, uh, atrocities and gross human rights violations. And in those in those two documents, they have sort of like guidelines of what the U.S. should do 
And, and a centerpiece of those strategy papers is empowering civil society. And the, the recommendations in those two strategy papers is exactly to deploy um, you know, US diplomacy and uh, deploy um, conditioning of, of security assistance and other assistance to, to countries that are putting people at risk uh, in these places. And I can't think of a I can't think of a place that is more at risk than or, or, or the violations are more gross than in a situation of apartheid, right? So it's not like we haven't reached the threshold in which the US should start considering, you know, using some of these um, some of these recommendations that are in these two strategy papers, but it also includes recommendations to use sanctions and to use financial restrictions against um, uh, state actors that are doing these kinds of things. And um, the idea that, you know, that the US is just sort of standing back and saying, uh, we got to wait for more, you know, more evidence that, you know, uh, about these these organizations that are human rights organizations, rather than ask, you know, asking itself, what should we be doing about, about Israel? Since we know, given the mounds and mounds of yellowing UN uh, documents and reports and investigations and the human rights reports that are talking about Israel's gross human rights violations, um, ethnic cleansing, uh, apartheid, that why isn't the US talking more about that rather than standing down and, and asking Israel, you know, if you got more evidence on these organizations, bring it, bring it on. I think that is really, really troubling. And, and as Kyle had pointed out, that's what's emboldening the continuation of this situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I, I think this is, you know, it's a cliche, but this is a real test. Um, I mean, there are so many tests. It's, you know, this is one of many uh, pressure points that Israel is putting on Palestinians. There is, of course, uh, the situation in Gaza, the blockade. There is uh, the expulsions of families in uh, Jerusalem and in uh, parts of the West Bank. Um, there is a full court press, really, I think, on multiple fronts to liquidate the, the Palestinian issue uh, from, from Israel's standpoint. Um, and the attack on Palestinian civil society is part and parcel of that. And we are reaching a point of no return. Um, you know, if this this whole thing, uh, I, I think really, if if the United States and the Europeans actually still care about a two-state solution, how can you possibly claim that you are going to do anything toward a two-state solution if you cannot even save organizations that you yourself are funding um, and have worked with and can vouch for, uh, and, and at the same time, you're rejecting Israel's uh, alleged evidence. This is a major test, and I feel like if, if this uh, is allowed to go unanswered, I mean, at some point, there has to be a, uh, a turning point, right? There has to be a point at which they say, this is the last straw, right? Um, uh, before, uh, you know, things uh, go completely south, even in terms of what they say are their priorities. And so, you know, in my mind, this is right up there with the expulsions in Jerusalem and uh, and other kind of existential threats that, that Israel's uh, actions are uh, 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 having on, on Palestinians. Um, if they can't respond to this uh, and effectively reverse it, um, and, and as we heard, I think they have the means, they have the leverage, it's just a matter of uh, demonstrating the political will uh, to expend that political capital in this instance, I think it could have a huge effect because it would be unprecedented because there has been no uh, accountability thus far. Um, and it could actually have a real snowball effect if, if if finally, once and for all, a line is drawn in the sand. Um, do I think that's gonna happen? I don't know, um, but I feel like it absolutely uh, needs to. Otherwise, um, none of their talk, no one can be taken seriously about their talk about two states or peaceful resolution of any kind. Um, I mean, I think we are going through this state war. Uh... It is an actual test. I, I, I agree it's a cliche, but it is an actual test. The, the, the red lines that were crossed this year are really 
uh, many of them are unprecedented, whether it's with the Shirin Abu Aqli situation or with the six groups. So, uh, I mean, let's uh, keep in mind that uh, when the U.S. loses its uh, legitimacy and political capital, uh, there is no easy way back to that. And I think there is a lot on, on the line. When we're talking about six Palestinian groups, but we're also talking about the United States political capital in the region. Um, are there any final remarks from the panelists? Uh, I think we have one minute until we end the, the call. So unless there are any burning last uh, <laughs> last minute thoughts, uh, I think we should maybe conclude the event. Uh, this event will be available on uh, Don's website, Democracy for the Arab World Now, uh, and on our Facebook page. Uh, folks can check it out there. Uh, please feel to share it with your uh, members of Congress with uh, all of your contacts in the US government uh, or anyone else uh, from your networks. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. A special thanks to the three co-hosts, uh, Zaha Hassan from the Carling Institute and Lara Friedman from uh, Foundation for Middle East Peace and Khalid al Gindi from the Middle East Institute. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everyone.